and really uh, welcome everybody. Welcome to the, the uh, first in our seminar series um, for, from SAFPAC. And I'm delighted that Michael is starting us off, Michael, Michael Guy Thompson. Michael has come and talked to us previously um, uh, when we used to have people flying on airplanes and things like that. Uh, but it's, as we were just saying earlier, one of the, at least the advantages of the Zoom is we're able uh, to, uh, to, 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 to have such an event this evening. So absolutely, so delighted to invite Michael. I think you know of Michael. Um, I mean, one of the things Michael trained at the Philadelphia Association, particularly with his supervisor, R.D. Lang, about 10 years before I arrived, I think something like that. Um, and um, uh, he set up um, free associations in, 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 in the States, in San Francisco, and uh, he's in, involved with e events at the Esalen Institute, connected with that. Author of many books, um, one I particularly recommend to you is The Death of Desire, which is an existential study in sanity and madness. Um, and Michael, you know, we, we have about just under an hour and a half for mm -hmm. you to um, tell us about uh, your, your topic this evening, which is the phenomenology of will and some time for questions within that, however you want to play it. Well, so wonderful. hand over to you, Michael. Okay, thank you so much, Dale. Uh, as some of you may know, Dale and I go back quite a long ways. Um, and uh, I especially look forward to the discussion period. For me, that's always uh, the most rewarding uh, portion of any presentation. So my paper should take about 35 minutes or so to, uh, to present, and then uh, we'll have plenty of time for any follow-up discussions, which I very much look forward to. So the topic of my presentation, as uh, Del just mentioned, is the phenomenology of will. Uh, so what does it mean to employ my will to do this or that? Or is will something that I can employ? Rather, does will employ me? What precisely do we mean by this term? A word we use all the time without ever giving it a second thought. I hope to show that this much used and abused term is more mysterious and complex than we typically suppose. There are two fundamentally opposed conceptions of will that persist to this day. One views will as synonymous with desire, which for the most part is unconscious. The other views will as synonymous with the ego, the rational part of our minds. We'll explore both conceptions in depth and see where that takes us. I'll begin with the conventional definition of will that most people nowadays typically embrace. It goes something like this. Will is the faculty of the mind that selects at the moment of decision, a desire among the variety of desires at my disposal. Will itself does not refer to a particular desire, but rather the mechanism responsible for choosing from among this or that desire. So what could be simpler? According to this definition, to will is to select an executive function of the mind, always at our disposal, which puts us, so to speak, in the driver's seat. I can will this way or that, yes or no. And via my will, I can make my desires come true. The more I exercise my will, the more successful I'm likely to be in the pursuit of my goals. Yes? All it takes is to will it so. The more will or willpower, the better. Do some people have more will than others? Is this what accounts for success in life? The person with the most willpower wins. 
There are innumerable problems with this conception of the will. First, it implies that by force of will, I deliberately choose or select from among my desires which one I decide to pursue. Then poof, I pursue it. I more or less will my desire to come true. A second problem is the premise that I have a good deal of control over my will. After all, if I employ will to achieve my desires, then I'm always ahead of my actions, always one step ahead of my desires in control. In fact, neither of these presumptions is persuasive. Will is not necessarily or always conscious. I'm never really in control of my will, nor do I select from among my desires which one I will opt for. My desires choose me. I do not choose my desires. How could we be so wrong about something so basic and ostensibly commonsensical? How could we be so confused about what this very simple word means? We say, where there is a will, there is a way. Yes, but what is will? Aristotle suggested that will may be voluntary or involuntary, but argued that some people are better at it than others. Following Plato, he implies that no one chooses to do wrong, for example. They simply don't know they are choosing badly out of ignorance. So the key to the right use of will is measured by the wisdom employed. Aristotle believes that the wise person always chooses rightly. In addition to wisdom, Aristotle also valued self-mastery. This may be where we got the idea that we're capable of becoming masters of our will, or potentially so. This notion has survived to the present. The belief that we employ will in order to do right was a popular idea among classical philosophers. A few centuries later, St. Augustine, who brought many of Aristotle's ideas into Christianity, refers to will as, quote, the mother and guardian of virtue. This implies that it is up to our will to be good Christians. In the early modern philosophical period, attention turned to whether will is or is not free. The term free will was introduced as distinct from will itself, as though one kind is free and the other isn't. Philosophers such as Hobbes, Spinoza, Locke, and Hume rejected this argument and attributed this misrepresentation to a verbal confusion. They concluded that all will is inherently free. This opens the door to whether will is entirely conscious and what we mean by the word free this is especially relevant to the question of ethics and the degree to which we are free to do good instead of harm. In the modern era, the 19th century German philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer, was the first philosopher to situate the will in the unconscious and to equate it with desire. His thesis fundamentally changed the way we conceptualize the nature of the will and whether it is something we can or cannot control. Schopenhauer's most famous remark about will goes something like this. You can do as you will, but you cannot will as you will. With this comment, Schopenhauer boldly claims that we have no control over our will our desire. Rather, our desire controls us. He abandons the executive function of the will and situates it within a maelstrom of feelings, desires, and inclinations. When we become truly conscious of ourselves, says Schopenhauer, 
we realize that our essential qualities are comprised of endless urging, craving, striving, wanting, and desiring. All these are characteristic of what he calls the will. Whereas his predecessors thought that will depends on knowledge and the deliberate execution of our conduct, Schopenhauer argued that our will is primary, primary and uses knowledge in order to satisfy its cravings. Ironically, this sounds an awful lot like Freud, doesn't it? Ironically, Schopenhauer concluded that this means we are not free because our actions are determined by our will, which according to Schopenhauer is synonymous with desire. Because we're at the mercy of our desires, we have no way of controlling them, no matter how hard we try. You only have to look at the drug addict to be persuaded of this thesis. Nietzsche was profoundly influenced by Schopenhauer's conception of the will, but did not embrace his pessimism. Nietzsche claimed that his entire philosophy was encapsulated in the simple motto, will to power, an enigmatic phrase that has no precise definition. I interpret it to mean desire to passion. So will is a word for desire, power is Nietzsche's term for passion meaning that we are creatures of our desire. We may desire many things in life, but the grandest and most essential is the desire to live passionately. This is not a game for the timid. Nietzsche was nothing if not passionate. The notion that we can exercise control over our desires was the furthest thing from his mind. Unlike Schopenhauer, Nietzsche equates desire with freedom. The fact that we have no control over our desires is precisely what makes them free. This raises the question, who am I? My desires or my capacity for rational thinking, the ego? Nietzsche embraced the former. Our desires do not and cannot control me because I am my desires, the seat of my agency and selfhood. What could be more personal than what I want from life? I now turn to the 20th century father of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud. Freud was profoundly influenced by both Schopenhauer's and Nietzsche's respective conceptions of the will. Unlike Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, Freud situated the will in the conscious portion of the mind, the ego. Yet, like Nietzsche and Schopenhauer, Freud conceives our desires, what he terms libido or the id, as the raison d'etre of our existence firmly lodged in our unconscious. He equates the relation between our will and our desire as analogous to a rider on a horse. The horse is our id or desire and knows where it wants to go. The rider, our ego or will, tries his best to guide the horse where the rider wants to go, but is not always successful in doing so. In order to get along, they have to compromise. The happy person has come to terms with his desires and tries his best to serve them by not getting in their way. The neurotic doesn't trust his desires and tries his best to suppress them out of fear. Freud is sometimes accused of favoring the rational part of the mind over the passions that drive us, but it isn't that simple. Like Schopenhauer, Freud was pessimistic about the degree to which we can be in harmony with our desires, but he was no cognitive psychologist. The worst thing we can do, says Freud, is to repress our desires. The happy person recognizes them as her master and devotes her life to serving them. 
Psychoanalysis was intended to serve this very purpose, to give our desires more liberty in the conduct of our lives. Our will can either serve our desires or obstinately suppress them, more often than not the latter. So what does this say about freedom and the will? What role does our rational mind play in achieving happiness, if not to guide and control our desires? Moreover, what are the implications for psychotherapy? Do we employ conscious will to make changes in our lives or to simply discover what we're up to? Which makes more sense, to equate will with desire or as the arbiter to our desire? And where do we locate choice? Is it a function of the ego, our rationality, or is it a function of desire, which would render choice an unconscious activity? For the answer to these questions, I now want to turn our attention to the 20th century existentialist philosopher, Jean Paul Sartre, and the clinical perspective of R.D. Lange, who was profoundly influenced by Sartre's philosophy. What difference does it ultimately make how we characterize the function of the will, whether we equate it with desire or whether we equate it with rationality, with the ego, so long as we are clear on how we define the respective functions? We know that human beings are driven by passion, the seat of emotions and desire, and have a capacity for rationality that serves as a kind of agent for our passions and a judge of appropriate action. Let's suppose that our passions are the seat of our desires and the ego is the seat of will, our capacity for rational judgment, and that they sometimes work in harmony and sometimes they are opposed. We will agree with Jean-Paul Sartre that human beings are fundamentally free and that their behavior is not determined by external causes or their genetic structure or even the mystification employed by their families and society. This means that all our actions are free that every feeling, ambition, and attitude are the consequence of my free choice. Even though these choices are not governed by my will, but by my desires. Though separated by an enormous gulf in theory, temperament, and vocation, Freud and Sartre would have agreed that our choices are free, but not willful. Rather, our choices are instigated by our desires. Freud would say that I render my choices unconsciously, whereas Sartre would argue that the choices are conscious, but on a pre-reflective level. So for those of you familiar with uh, Sartre's philosophy and his critique of Freud, he replaces the notion of unconscious uh, action with uh, pre-conscious. I only become aware of the choices I make after having made them. In both cases, it wasn't my ego or I that chose the action. The so-called conscious choice merely makes it official after the fact. This means that I can never get ahead of my choices, that I'm always one step behind them, guiding me this way or that. This explains why I often do not know why I choose this over that, because my choices are not rational. This is why psychoanalysis is retrospective, not prophylactic. Only in behavioral psychology do we play the fiction of deliberating what we intend to do and then execute the act. In psychoanalysis, the idea is to review previous actions and learn something about ourselves from them. 
The actions under review may be buried in our childhoods, or they may have occurred moments earlier in the analytic session. In either case, we're not talking about an executive function of the mind, but a reflective one. This has led some to conclude that Freud's conception of the unconscious was deterministic. If we don't make our choices consciously, which is to say voluntaristically, then our choices must be made for us by our unconscious. This implies there is no free choice in the matter if the choice isn't willfully executed. This conclusion is rooted in a misconception about the nature of choice and whether we have conscious control over our decisions. We know from Freud's horse and rider analogy that it is the horse that drives the rider, not the other way around. Just because my choices are free doesn't mean I am in control of them. Freedom doesn't turn me into Superman. It doesn't make me omnipotent. My free choice isn't the freedom to dominate or overpower. It is a freedom to be me and to embrace the me that I am, warts and all. Sartre suggests that our neuroses go all the way back to a fundamental choice in our childhood when we chose what our neurosis would be on an unconscious pre-reflective level. This means that we intend our psychopathology. We are not the consequence of this or that trauma. Nothing caused my condition. Rather, I chose to experience this or that incident as traumatic. I'm ultimately responsible for who I am and how I became who I am. Given this thesis, how is therapy even possible? If I cannot will myself to health, then how does change come about? When I asked Lang this question in one of my supervision sessions with him, he answered with one word, indirectly. All my conscious knowing mind is good for in therapy is to acquaint myself with the mysterious nature of my existence and plumb its depths over an indeterminate amount of time. I cannot will myself to overcome the fear of intimacy. I cannot compel myself to love more generously, behave more compassionately, or feel more alive. Yet all of these dilemmas often improve as a consequence of the therapeutic endeavor to know ourselves. How? Well, we don't know exactly. All we do know is that going all the way back to the Delphic Oracle's command to know thyself, that knowing oneself has the potential to change our lives forever, to finally become who we are authentically. So how has behavioral psychology and more recently cognitive behavioral therapy approach the role of will in the therapeutic process. Psychology and its endeavor to appear more scientific than philosophy equates will with volition. Following the Stoics, behavioral psychologists situate the will in the conscious portions of the mind and insist that all our choices are driven by rationality, not by desire. According to this thesis, my will has the ability to decide upon and commit to any course of action. It isn't my desire that prompts me to make this or that choice, but rational thought processes. Will is defined as a purposive striving and is one of four primary psychological functions, along with affect, motivation, and cognition. Volition and willpower, from this perspective, are the same thing. In behavioral therapy, you decide to accomplish a task, such as overcoming the fear of flying, 
And over time, you will yourself to overcome this fear by recognizing that your fear is irrational. Does this work? Yes and no. As with other therapies, some people improve and others do not. But according to Lang, what probably helps CBT patients to actually change anything is always a function of their desire, not their will. They just don't know it and attribute their successes to willful engagements with their problems. According to Lang, it was probably the relationship with the therapist that eventually provide, provided the desire to change, not willfully, but indirectly, which is to say unconsciously. Lang was a committed existentialist and synthesized Freud's and Sartre's respective perspectives by situating our self in our desires instead of our ego, which is essentially our character traits. Uh, the ego is also the seat of all of our fears and our defenses. This limits the function of the will to an agent of synthesis and repression a view that was also embraced by Jacques Lacan. So how does this perspective show up in the context of a clinical situation? For a perfect example of how Lang believed that successful behavior always follows one's desire rather than will, let's take a look at the drug addict. The addict may feel that he should stop drinking or drugging because he should, should or because it is destroying his life. But unless he genuinely wants to, he will fail. The will is an executive function that can either serve desire or oppose it. When in opposition, the person is in conflict with his or her desire. But if he tries to control it with his will, the result will be haphazard. The addict tells himself that he needs to get in control of his life, his addiction, as though he can steel himself against his desire to drink or eat too much by a force of will. This is his dilemma, an obstinate refusal to genuinely want to give up this or that drug or behavior, but relies instead on an interjected mommy to make him do so. According to Lang, this never works. Yes, you can live your life this way, getting off and then back on the wagon, in and out of rehab, AA meetings, etc., but without ever really giving it up, both protecting your desire while fighting against it as a way of life, without terminus. At bottom, the addict wants to be free of the pain that is elicited by desire. So he medicates his pain with this or that drug. But you can never kill your desire, you can only redirect it. Because desire always entails risk and occasional failure, he suffers from an intolerance of the pain that the addiction momentarily relieves. This suggests that addiction is a form of suicide, which occasionally succeeds in the deliberate or accidental overdose, organ failure, obesity, wanting to die, or hoping to. The same principle applies to any occasion when we galvanize the will to suppress the pain of our desire, the pain of living. This is the most common circumstance that inspires a person to seek therapy. For some of us, our desire is so weak that all we have left is the will to carry on, but without joy. Having buried our desire, we nevertheless manage to eke out a measure of success, driven by will alone. But are we happy? We can sometimes lead Will can sometimes lead to enviable wealth, yet leaves us wondering why our lives are devoid of passion. 
The irony is you don't really need drugs to reduce anxiety. Your will can do it for you. Will and desire, more often than not, are at cross purposes regarding how much risk we allow in our lives. Though will can be an instrument for change, more often it is not. To a surprising degree, will resist change. Genuine change only comes about when we want to change, not because we need to or because we should. Lang's conception of psychic freedom was radical and disturbing to those who fear their desire and are anxious to manage it. Lang believed what is missing in their lives is opening their hearts to risk. Unfortunately, life occasions risk and fear is its greatest impediment. How much we're willing to risk is ultimately our choice, however much we may wish that it is not. Thank you. Well, Michael, thank, thank you very much indeed. Um, I, when you started, I thought, oh, that's, um, we've got a good time for discussion and questions, but given there's so much in what you said, I don't know if we have got enough time, but let's, uh, let's see uh, where it goes. So um, can we open up please to uh, comments, questions? Yeah, hi. Can I question? <laughs> hi. Um, hi, thank you so much. That was fascinating and complicated and complex <laughs> and invigorating. Oh, well, thank um, you. Uh, Sarah, right? Yeah, it is. Hi. Um, hi. I wondered what you knew about John Barge's work on automaticity and the new unconscious. Nothing. Okay. Um, yeah, I just, well, yeah. He, he, the, cognitive and uh, social cognitive, but he, he perceives Freud as, a, you, you state that, you know, that Freud was no cognitive psychologist and he perceives Freud as a sort of the first cognitist in a sense by the way, the, the, the perception of the, the, the non-conscious as a, as a driver of desire. Um, but he, it's moved on to, I guess in Lang has moved on to be more positivist in not in that, in that sense but it, it's not just about it's not negative in a sense um because it made me it made me question about how about the word free free will and i, I find that quite difficult to understand um and it so could you just explain i find that difficult to understand I mean, if you could explain that further that would be really helpful Okay, okay, I'll, be, I'll give it a try. I, I do agree that that is the most difficult uh, notion um, of the nature of freedom in the context of psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. Um, and of course, this is a theme embraced by all existentialist uh, philosophers. Uh, Sartre, uh, I uh, mention uh, for two reasons. One, he uh, had a huge impact on uh, Lang's thinking, but also because uh, Sartre's idea about freedom was by far the most radical of any of the existentialist philosophers. Um, I think the nub of the problem that we have with the notion of uh, freedom, uh, you know, that I'm free to choose, uh, uh, like, uh, for example, free to choose which presidential candidate uh, that I have decided um, to uh, vote for in the current election, that I bring my conscious will to bear to make this choice. I think we all know this is a complete fiction. Uh, the reason why any of us choose a particular uh, candidate, I think comes from desire. Uh, we like this or that candidate. Uh, one of the odd things about uh, Trump, for example, is that apparently uh, nearly half of Americans adore this man. Uh, and you just have to wonder, uh, is there anything rational about this? You know, um, We, I think, uh, equate uh, free choice 
with uh, what is sometimes referred to as volunteerism. Um, you know, the, uh, in fact, this was a, a criticism made against the early Heidegger. Uh, when he talks about resoluteness uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the context of authenticity, that one must be resolute uh, in the pursuit of living an authentic life. Um, well, uh, was Heidegger referring to the use of the will uh, when he referred to resoluteness? Uh, I don't believe that he did. And if you read uh, Heidegger's uh, four volume work on Nietzsche, uh, he takes on this question and makes it quite clear that for him resoluteness uh, comes from someplace else than the will. Um, we, uh, we like to think that we can consciously make choices. Mm. And I think this is the nub of the issue. What we usually discover in psychoanalysis is that, you know, how did I get into this situation? You know, how, how did I get into this marriage or this relationship uh, uh, without really knowing what I was getting into uh, until I was way into this process? Um, do I really have any choice in the matter uh, using my will in terms of whether I want to stay in this relationship or not. I don't think it's the will uh, that determines that. I think that it, uh, we come to these decisions in a way that is part of a process that we're embroiled in. And uh, our heart is the main thing that's really invested in this. Uh, as long as our heart is strong and we're passionate about a person, uh, we may uh, endure all kinds of uh, mischief and hardship in order to stay with them. But if we lose heart and we lose uh, the love that we had for them, uh, that's when we're more likely to abandon that. Then we decide, okay, I'm going to go ahead and abandon this relationship. Mm -hmm. But the decision to abandon was already made by one's heart not by one's rationality. So if you look at it from that angle, it's our heart that's really guiding us, what Freud calls the id, uh, not our rational egos. Um, because we have no control over how we're going to desire and what we're going to desire is what makes it free. Mm. And that I think is the most difficult piece of this to wrap one's head around uh, because it sounds like it's not free at all, it's determining us. Well, that, that would imply that the unconscious is a separate intelligence at work, you know, and that we have two minds. Um, and uh, I reject that notion. Uh, I don't think we have two minds. We have one mind, uh, but we do have a problem of uh, the will, which is afraid of some of the things our desire gets up to and whether our desire is strong enough to override that fear. Isn't it, isn't it like uh, there's possibly a, a misreading so often of, of the Sartre sort of uh, phrase, I am my choices. Yeah? Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's that so many people seem to take it as a rationalization as I can be who I want to be or all that sort of stuff. Whereas Absolutely. Yeah, whereas, you know, I think what you're saying is, is that it's not, it, it's the heart, not the mind. And mm -hmm. it's being the heart that possibly that one is, by being free, one's free to be subject to things. It's almost like a Lacanian thing that um, mm -hmm. we don't speak words, words speak us. And to be free to, to be allowed, exactly. the words to, exactly. to speak us. Exactly, mm -hmm. Bill, exactly. Uh, the, the words speak us, uh, that's very prominent in Heidegger you know, which Lacan gets a lot of that from, uh, that language speaks us, we don't speak language. Um, and, uh, and yes, I, I think that uh, we, we, we want control over our lives. Mm. We, we love the idea that we can uh, deliberate about something and make a decision. And that choice, of course, will be a free choice. Uh, but, um, that's a fiction. Yeah, I, I, I don't think we have control over anything. 
in our lives? Yeah, uh, w- one of the things I was going to say, I've been uh, doing a bit of writing lately, and I kept thinking of will more of a towardsness. I kept thinking about final cause, purpose, um, and there's something about the final purpose isn't in our control. It's it's more that will moves, whether you like it or not, you're moving. Um, and, the, and there is this almost illusion of, well, if I can pretend that I'm choosing this, then I have some sort of control over it. And that's where, for me, Heidegger's time kicks in, mm-hmm. you know? And there's this mm-hmm. kind of, we're moving towards something that isn't in our remit. We don't know what we're going to end up with. But along the way, we almost make these delusional choices to kind of pretend that we've got the controls that we don't have to actually accept anything that we're moving mm-hmm. towards mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. that's exactly. kind of how i was seeing it to some degree yeah. yeah 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 well i think uh yeah even when heidegger talks about uh being authentic or being an inauthentic he's not suggesting that you just choose you know mm. one or the other you you find yourself you know at certain yeah. times in your life uh, inclined in this direction, uh, in some ways you may feel, well, I really have no choice in the matter. I can't live with myself if I don't mm. you know, behave in a certain way. Um, but as, like I said, that's, by that time, the decision is simply the official decision. You know, we've announced it. Mm-hmm. Um, but meanwhile, there's all this stuff going on below the surface uh, mm-hmm. that we don't really have any control over whatsoever. Um, the, the, one of the things that I, uh, I really appreciated about Lacan, and I, and I think uh, his reading of Freud, um, is the idea that the ego it really has a very limited role in our lives, and what Freud refers to as the id, uh, which uh, Lacan replaces with the subject of desire, uh, it's really the id that is driving everything. Uh, the, the id has far more to say about what's going on in our day-to-day lives. It's not just blind instinct, you know, that has to be harnessed with this intelligence. The, it is intelligent already. And in some ways, I think Freud kind of got it backwards. You know, the, it's really the id that is driving everything in our lives, our passion. And the ego is basically there to protect us uh, from things is, uh, and it's including our desires, you know? Uh, so it's a repressive agent. Uh, all of our fear comes out of our ego, not out of our uh, desires. Could I ask you if, if it's possible to talk a bit more about the idea that the failure to have the interjected mum, mother figure meant that, that, that then giving up drugs or, or, or drink or food or whatever wasn't, wasn't able almost as if it had been successful. I'm wondering how that fits in really with the desire or will. Uh, well, the interjected you, mummy, I think is what you said. Yeah, yeah, interjected yeah. The, the mummy. Um, well, I, uh, you know, I, of course, America has such a checkered history with uh, alcohol, as you probably know, we even outlawed it, you know, for for many years, and that turned out to be a complete joke. Mm-hmm. Uh, but AA definitely caught on in American culture as a way that people could get in control of their uh, drinking. And then it expanded to almost anything. Uh, you know, there's these kinds of groups for any sort of behavior, including sex addiction, yeah. uh, that people can go and have support groups. The mystery is how does AA really work? Mm. Uh, you know, they would argue there's a spiritual dimension, you have to hit bottom, you have to go through these steps. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, it's really the group, obviously, that, that is the real power in, uh, in the AA phenomenon. Um, and uh, uh, yes, you can use the group and the attendance to sessions uh, with frequency as a way to steal yourself from the very thing that you crave. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day at a time, uh, you do receive the praise from the other members of the group uh, to the degree that you succeed and you receive their forgiveness uh, when you fail. 
so you have this uh, comfort, you know, mm -hmm. uh, of support and the peer group. And uh, however, if that's all it is, if that's where you're stuck, you know, you really crave this thing, but you don't want to let the group down. And, uh, you know, you value what you get from the group versus what you're getting from the drug. Uh, you can continue that way. Uh, but if you still desire the drug, um, it's going to be a very difficult uh, uh, life. And I'm sure many of you have had uh, addicts in your own practices uh, and uh, have run into that uh, yourselves. Uh, some people, however, do have extraordinary success with the AA uh, regimen. And they uh, not only uh, give up uh, the alcohol, the drug, uh, whatever the addiction might be, and, uh, and are perfectly happy. Um, at this point, it's not the will uh, that is responsible. They simply stopped wanting it. They stopped valuing it. They no longer have the taste for it. They no longer have the craving. They moved on. Uh, that's uh, relatively rare mm. in people who struggle with tobacco addictions, alcohol addictions, and so forth. Uh, for them, it's mostly a haphazard process um, and one that still has a considerable amount of turmoil underpinning uh, their everyday life and their ability to find love in their life, uh, to devote themselves to other passionate pursuits. Um, so, uh, so I do think that uh, AA is an admirable uh, resource and, uh, and something that has been a help to many, many people, but I, uh, I, I don't think even they know why it succeeds and uh, fails. Michael, and could, I just, could I just contest you on all of that? Not all of it, but... Of course. The point, yeah, the point about step one in Alcoholics Anonymous is... Are you familiar with something called the ironic effect? So consciously, the more you try to do something, the more you're going to fail as, if, as, as what you've just said. And so it's, so the, it's the non-conscious automatic um, way forward, really. And so in step one, in Alcoholics Anonymous, in all those fellowship groups, when people, um, I, I came to believe that, um, no, that, um, I, that I am powerless um, over alcohol and my life has become unmanageable. So I think it's, I came to think that in that step one, the word powerless means I'm not going to strive to change. I'm not going to push forward with, with my will consciously. I'm not going to drive, sorry about this, a fireworks. Um, so I would, I'm going to relinquish that, that effort, if you like. I'm going to sit back and relax in, in that admittance of powerlessness, which actually allows the non-conscious, the desire to come forward, it, it, and you, you touched on it. And I believe that's how it works. So mm -hmm. they relax into the group. They say they came to believe in a God, which can be an acronym for group of drunks or good or direction, which moves mm -hmm. one forward. But in that powerlessness, they sit back into their non-conscious, pre-conscious and allow other desires to emerge. And that's my belief how it works. Well, I love that. Uh, I love that explanation for it. And I... Uh, and of course, I allow that uh, there is no governing body, you know, that runs all of the AA groups. You know, it's it's really a product of how each group uh, constitutes itself and the people that are there and how they interpret these rules also. And I think you're right. There's a tremendous variety from one group to another uh, mm -hmm. in levels of sophistication in this Absolutely. very question. And I do believe that there's a lot of people Nate, that would agree with you and and even with me, that it is desire that is really the essential key to ultimately, um, you know, ridding yourself of the uh, craving. Yeah. 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 And that desire has to go somewhere else. Um, I, I do th agree with Freud that I think all of us are love addicts, that, that we do need uh, to feel both loved um, by people, but also we need to love our lives 
uh, the people that are in our world, uh, that the more that we're able to do that, the more joy that we get out of our life. And, uh, and that uh, drugs and addictions are often substitutes for that missing in their life. Uh, so, of course, it makes a lot of sense that you would turn to a group that, uh, that is rooted in compassion. Thank you. That can be very contagious. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I love that comment. Yes. <laughs> And of course, I use uh, this analogy of, uh, you know, addiction, I suppose, because it is the, um, uh, the most difficult one uh, to apply it to, uh, just in terms of psychotherapy and psychoanalytic work uh, with patients who are not struggling with addictions, um, you know, who are just struggling with uh, finding love in their lives. Uh, I don't know about uh, you, but for me, most of my uh, practice is devoted to people that either are alone and uh, looking for something that's missing in their lives, or they're stuck in relationships that are very unsatisfying, but they can't seem to break away from them uh, and uh, make any sense of it. Uh, so I, I do, I do agree that um, this is this is the driving force of everything that that we need to feel connected to other people. And we need to feel connected to our life in a very vital way. Uh, but we have innumerable reasons, uh, uh, depending on our histories, why there's so much fear around those very pursuits. Uh, so anything that it can encourages us to take a chance and try something different mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, is really to our advantage. And whether that's psychotherapy or a, a groups or what have you. I wonder if you might say, um, I wonder if you might say something a little bit more maybe about something you touched on in the paper. You, you said something about the prophylactic, the preventative use of psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know that there is, a, uh, there is a tradition, isn't there, of people who think that uh, you might have a preventative analysis, you might give children uh, analysis and somehow prevent them from falling ill. This has sort of been more, I think, something that the Kleinians have been more in, more engaged in. So, but I wonder if you'd say a bit more about that in, in, a, in relation to your paper, because you're very clear that, of course, this doesn't make a great deal of sense because psychoanalysis is, must be retrospective. Or yes? Yes, yes. Uh, uh I'm sorry, I couldn't quite catch your name. Oh, oh, my, name my name is Onel. We've met before sometime yeah. when, when I was at the PA, yeah? So oh, I'm, great, Onel. Good, yeah. good. I thought you looked familiar. Yeah. Good to see you, yes. Nice to see you again. Yeah. Um, uh, so your question is? I guess my question is, it's, it's just a question about, um, the idea that psychoanalysis could be used to prevent people from falling ill. And because there is, because there's a tradition of um, using that, having this, especially in, I think in child analysis, the mm -hmm. idea of something much more preventative being done. So I wondered if you had any thoughts about that in relation to your paper. Well, you know, I, I agree that this is, um a source of some controversy in uh, the way psychoanalysis has evolved over the last century. Um, there's, um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Samuel Lipton, who was a uh, Chicago psychoanalyst, uh, ego psychologist, um, and um, uh, wrote this amazing paper in the 1970s on uh, Freud's treatment of the rat man to, um, to look at how American psychoanalysts um, who had departed from Freud were beginning to employ uh, techniques 
that seem to be unanalytic. <laughs> um, for example, attempts to uh, control the transference, uh, to um, prevent people from uh, having certain experiences in the uh, treatment situation. Uh, and most of this fell on the uh, behavior of the analyst uh, herself, um, you know, to uh, withdraw, uh, for example, from the relationship, to be silent for almost all of the hour, uh, to not say or do anything that might contaminate the transference, uh, no offering of um, advice and so on. And the rationale for all this uh, innovations of technique um, was that you mustn't make a mistake because if you do, that could really damage uh, irreparably uh, the relationship. Uh, one example of that was an analyst who uh, said that one must never have an office in one's home uh, because if the patient enters the home of the practitioner and you see all of these personal items that reveals something to you about who this uh, analyst is in person, uh, then the transference is destroyed forever and, uh, and you've completely blown it. Well, these maneuvers are all prophylactic. Uh, they're ways of trying to prevent certain things from happening. Uh, now, uh, Lipton's observation was that that is completely out of keeping with the original character of psychoanalysis, which is that it's the patient who is really in control. And if the, um, if the analyst makes a mistake, says something that's upsetting or what have you, one can talk about it, analyze it, work it out. It's not irreparable. Um, so uh, in that sense, I'm arguing that the whole purpose of analysis is to not guide our patients into making this choice or that choice, um, but to leave that autonomy clearly in the hands of our patients and let them make mistakes, let them uh, uh, pursue courses of actions that in our minds may be problematical and are going to lead to uh, some sort of failure. Uh, then we'll analyze the consequences of that behavior and learn from them rather than trying to steer our patients in this way or that. Now, I'm confident that there are analysts who violate that and who do advocate certain uh, pursuits and decisions uh, as you're describing with uh, the Kleinians. That, by the way, uh, uh, may be more allowed with uh, treating children uh, than with treating adults. Um, and um, of course, child analysis is very popular in the UK, much more than in the United States. Um, but, uh, but I think certain allowances might be made for working with children. But ideally, my argument is that even with children, uh, they should be allowed to make use of the space on their own, uh, to play with it. You enter into a relationship with them and it's really the relationship with the therapist that is the healing agent, not any advice or direction that uh, a therapist might be providing. But of course, cognitive therapy is purely um, prophylactic. Cogni uh, someone else uh, mentioned something about cognitive therapy earlier. Uh, I... Um, you know, of course, cognitive therapy does come out of psychoanalysis. Uh, virtually all therapies uh, do. Uh, you know, going back to the past, looking for reasons why you develop this particular fear or phobia and trying to retrace the history of that. That's all sounds very psychoanalytic. Uh, where it departs from psychoanalysis is then the prophylactic portion of it. Uh, homework, advice giving, direction. That, that's where it completely departs from uh, a psychodynamic um, approach to treatment. But thanks for your question.
Are you all engaged in psychodynamic work? Uh, is that uh, is that your orientation, or how how does that work with uh, your clinical um, experiences? Every everyone here is or has been in uh, in uh, analytic psychotherapy and had analytic supervision, but certainly not it. We have some visitors here today, but with the with regard to the SAFPAC training. We, we regard ourselves as existential psychoanalytic and in uh -huh. that order. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Not okay. psychoanalytic existential. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, that's a tricky uh, business, isn't it? Integrating existentialism and psychoanalysis. <laughs> right. Uh, I actually wondered if you might say some more. One of the many things that we haven't really done enough of is, is, is look at Sartre, you know? Uh, it's sort of gone out of fashion a bit lately over here. Um, I think, at least for us, and perhaps wrongly. And I just wonder if, if people didn't have any specific questions at the moment, if, if, if you might say a little bit more about Sartre, about Sartre, psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. Mm. If, that's, if that's possible. Well, of course, uh, you know, I, I'd be happy to send all of you a paper, by the way, that I gave um, a couple of years ago to the North American Sartre Society on Sartre and Freud. Oh. And, uh, and, uh, and I took a bit of that uh, for my uh, talk today, uh, but it went far more into uh, Sartre's relationship with Freud and how terribly useful I think Sartre is for interpreting Freud. Uh, you know, of all the existentialists, uh, Sartre uh, was probably the most interested in Freud. Um, uh, he he uh, didn't study all of Freud's writings. Um, that's been one criticism uh, that a lot of his thinking was based in the early Freud. Uh, Merleau-Ponty, of course, was very, very, um, positive about uh, Freud and psychoanalysis. Uh, Merleau-Ponty was himself married to a psychoanalyst um, and, uh, and uh, uh, said a number of things about Freud and psychoanalysis that were complementary, uh, but didn't devote all that much uh, time to it. Uh, and of course, Heidegger uh, pretty much dismissed Freud um, in the Zolikon seminars. Uh, he did, um, I uh, think that Freud's technical papers were uh, brilliant and were very phenomenological mm -hmm. and that his conception of free associating, uh, just letting people speak their minds without any uh, direction and that the attitude that Freud advocates for the psychoanalyst, free floating, um, uh, evenly suspended attention, uh, which of course gets translated as neutrality uh, was also the perfect mindset in Heidegger's view for how the practitioner should conduct herself of just having an open mind, taking things in, not jumping to conclusions and resisting making judgments about the matter. Of course, Bion took this on uh, probably more than any other psychoanalyst since Freud. Um, so, um, but what I really, really like about Sartre, uh, there's also his books on the emotions, uh, which is a very small critique of uh, different theories of emotions. There's the behavioral theory, there's the psychoanalytic theory, and there's the phenomenological theory. And uh, it's a brilliant little uh, uh, critique of psychoanalysis uh, that only takes a few pages. Um, uh, what you get, what I get from uh, Sartre is it's, uh, it's a very sympathetic and close reading of Freud. And it's almost as though the only real problem he has with Freud is semantics. He doesn't like the term unconscious and, uh, and replaces it with pre-reflective uh, consciousness, uh, which I think is a very workable um, uh, idea, it, it may be still too obsessed with the concept of consciousness as key uh, to all this. You know, Heidegger never uses the word conscious or consciousness. Uh, he, he thinks it's a useless uh, concept. 
Um, he has other ways, you know, of trying to get to this idea that that we're not in con uh, conscious volitional control of our experiences and um, and uh, how we conduct our lives uh, day to day. Um, but the thing that really touched me the most about Sartre is is the emphasis on the nature of freedom and free choice, um, and that our um, our choices are definitely made by me, um, but it's a process. Uh, as Heidegger might say, choices are temporalized. You know, they, they can't occur in a snapshot, uh, even though it may seem at times that, yes, now I will choose to purchase this house. Uh, there's all the stuff that's gone on before that that has led up to whether that choice is going to get made. And in that sense, the choice has already been made by the time we finally uh, announce it. Um, of course, uh, this gives us a lot of insight into the nature of ambivalence uh, because uh, the ambivalent person who's you know, our typical neurotic, I mean, uh, we all struggle with ambivalence to some degree, but uh, for some people it controls their lives and they can never commit themselves you know, uh, to this or that decision, um, Sartre would argue that uh, becoming ambivalent is a free choice. That, you know, that the ambivalent person isn't torn between this choice and that choice. They've already chosen ambivalence. And there's something omnipotent about ambivalence. Uh, we want it both ways. We don't want to have to give up the one for the other. Uh, and uh, so in that sense, uh, the problem with that person is that they can't completely give themselves over to their desire. They keep coming up with reasons, you know, to delay that. So there, there's a lot in Sartre that I, uh, that I love and could go into further. Uh, but I'll send you this paper, uh, Dell, and if you want to distribute it, uh, feel free to. Uh, I, I tease out, you know, this in far more detail. Thanks very much. We very much, we've read several of your papers and would welcome that. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Great. Yes, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, go on. Sorry, I, I didn't want to interrupt you. You're going, you're going to say something. No, 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 no. Go, uh, go ahead. I, I was saying, just saying, I, um, I look forward to reading that paper. Yeah, um, I, but I wanted to take us back a bit to something you, you said about... Um, when you were talking about Freud, there's, there's a, I guess I'm thinking that, you, does, does your paper have something to do with, Freud had an exchange with um, Hilda Doolittle. And in, in that exchange, Freud apparently said to her, my, my, my discovery is not a cure all. It, it, it is the beginning of a grave philosophy. Mm -hmm. Very few, very few understand that. Very few can understand that. And I wonder if you think that that might have something to do with what you've just presented us. You know, this, this has that great philosophy got something to do with, with Freud's notion of the of the will, and uh, uh -huh. and and about you know to what extent we are, uh, I suppose to what extent we are horse and trying very, very hard to be rider, to put it that way. Yeah, 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 yes. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, I, um, you know, it's so uh, complicated with Freud. Uh, you know, as you no doubt know, Lacan preferred the early Freud, the pre-structural model Freud. Uh, and uh, in some ways, um, there was something more pure about Freud in the beginning, uh, before he came up with uh, drive theory, uh, before instincts took on such a decisive role, before he switched all the emphasis to the ego and defense mechanisms, uh, he seemed to get further and further away from the person uh, who was in analysis. Uh, in fact, one of the terms that Freud uses early uh, uh, pre-structural model is the word counter will uh, for the unconscious, you know, that, that he thought that there were almost like two wills at work, you know, 
there's the uh, will that let's say associated with the ego, and then there's the will that's more associated with the id. Of course, he didn't have a conception of the id at this time. It was uh, conscious, pre-conscious, and unconscious, and censor. Um, uh, so as time goes along and Freud adopts the structural model, um, everything seems to become slightly more scientific and slightly more rational. And, um, uh, and that part, of course, uh, from a theoretical angle is, is a little uh, disappointing. Um, but Freud was anything but a, a, a systematic thinker. He, he was constantly revisiting and tinkering with uh, ideas throughout his lifetime and career, never felt satisfied with them. And um, late in his life, it seems like he made a turnaround uh, yet again. And you see this in a number of uh, books that were published by former patients of Freud's who describe in some detail what their analysis was like. Uh, you know, Smiley Blanton uh, was one of these people. Hilda Doolittle was another one. Uh, there's about five or six of these um, famous, uh, 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 and, and how many, you know, former patients have written about their treatments with an analyst? Uh, I mean, it's like a gold mine uh, because it's the only way you ever get to see, you know, uh, how he actually conducts himself. And the one thing that they all shared in common, this would have been the last decade of Freud's life, is that the only thing he really wanted to hear from his patients was their free associations. Uh, he did not analyze the ego. He did not analyze the defense mechanisms. He did not engage in all this work that the Americans uh, took on and, and reduced analysis to. He stayed with basically the desire of the patient and just wanted to give them room to talk to him about it. And he was convinced that it really was a talking cure, uh, that the more you can verbalize the drama of your life to another person and share it with them with this extraordinary intimacy, something good is going to come of this. Uh, but what causes that something good to happen, uh, Freud acknowledged was a mystery. Mm -hmm. I, one of the things I was going to say is, do you think there's something in the idea of predictability and unpredictability and something about being in a space with someone where the unpredictability does create something completely new? And I kept thinking of Freud's compulsion to repeat. And I kept thinking of this repetition, these choices that re repeat you in the same pattern. And yeah. That maybeability is that and we're always trying to strive to to enter the source of the unknown in some way. And maybe being in a space with someone who isn't predictable, but uh -huh. it might be safe, does something. I'm thinking more like Hannah Aran at the moment in in terms of, you know, speech, the what we say, not knowing what we're gonna say, and not knowing what the other person's gonna think. Mm -hmm. Something happens, something very different happens. Yeah, I love Hannah Arendt. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, she's a remarkable uh, thinker. By the way, she hated psychoanalysis. Uh, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> a, a friend of mine was a student of Hannah Arendt in Chicago, uh, kind of a protege, uh, you know, in the philosophy uh, department. And, um, and he uh, secretly got increasingly interested in psychoanalysis. Uh, he was originally South African and, um, and started reading Lacan and Freud. And then he announced to Hannah Arendt one day, um, you know what, I've decided that I think I wanna pursue a psychoanalytic education. Well, she never talked to him again. She, she said she's so disappointed in that decision. <laughs> um, <laughs> But what you said about <laughs> surprise uh, does remind me of a very interesting um, experience I had with Gregory Bateson, you know, the American anthropologist who was famous for uh, a book called Steps to an Ecology of Mind uh, in the 1970s. Uh, Bateson was a friend of Lang's 
and uh, visited London when I was living there in the 70s. Um, uh, he was dying of cancer and, uh, you know, quite old uh, and gave this wonderful uh, lecture. Um, we organized a public lecture for him um, on his uh, work with dolphins. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and he said that he discovered a very interesting thing about dolphins. Um, that, uh, you know, they, of course, perform tricks. You, you, uh, you can train them very readily uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to do what they're told to do and reward them, as you would uh, most animals. Mm -hmm. And then um, his research team one day noticed that one of the dolphins uh, completely violated what it was that they had been training the dolphin to do. It had originally mastered this, uh, you know, sequence that had been taught. And then one day just decided to do something completely different. And uh, at f initially they thought this was some failure in the training. Uh, and then they noticed another dolphin uh, engaged in this behavior. And before long, they began to realize something they hadn't known about dolphins. They get bored with doing the same old trick over and over again. And at a certain point, they wanna try something new and they innovate. This thrilled them to no end when they discovered this. Uh, of course, it shows you how smart uh, dolphins are. But what I loved about this uh, lecture of Bateson, he then said, you know, there's something comparable that happens in neurosis. Uh, you know, we do the same old thing over and over and over again. And, um, and we just don't want to let go of uh, these uh, tried uh, yet untrue, you know, methods <laughs> of trying to get what we want out of life. But he said, uh, one day, much to your surprise, your patient tries something new. And that, Bateson felt, was the key to a successful therapy experience is that yes, you keep doing the same old thing over and over. And then eventually, if you're lucky, you've reached the end of your rope with it. Not because your analyst is urging you, you know, you must try something different for goodness sake. You yourself have come to that. Maybe almost like the AA person uh, comes to that, you know, and then they just depart and yes. it wasn't conscious yeah decision you know it just happens mm. i loved that mm. that's great so i, I think I just, you're right I, I think that um there's an american analyst i don't know if you know him donnell stern who wrote a book called courting surprise and it uh, addresses exactly this topic uh that ideally uh, we conduct our uh therapy sessions with our patients in such a way that we're the only thing we're encouraging is uh, take me by surprise, you know, surprise mm. me. Do something that's not so predictable, but you're the one who does that. Mm. Can, can I just ask, I, I heard a slightly different version of that story. Yeah. Um, which, I, which I think says something about frustration. And, okay. and, and I don't know if, that my version's true, but <laughs> um, but I, I heard that there was an element where where um, Bateson was um, uh, that the, the people involved with the dolphins wanted wanted new things to happen, and Bateson sort of said, "Okay, so so what he said was, well, we we um, we won't do anything," mm -hmm. and. And the 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 other people involved got pretty frustrated with it, um, and and he said, "Well, just just wait." <laughs> and and eventually, that I'd heard that this was the start of the dolphins suddenly doing very different things. Mm. And I, I I thought the story was saying something about frustration and, <laughs> and surprise and frustration, sort of. You know that, that that something about the therapist being um, uh, being unpredictable, but also this thing of I guess to do with Lacan and, and frustrating mm -hmm. desire. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but, that's an interesting point. I, I maybe you filling in some of the things that Bateson didn't, uh, you know, share with us uh, about uh, about that. Uh, maybe there just wasn't time, or uh, maybe it took away from the point, you know, that he was wanting to make about it. Uh, I, that is something about Lacan that, uh, of course, it does impress me, is that he seemed to be a master at taking his patients by surprise. Uh, yeah. Of course, if you've read the Stuart Schneiderman account of his uh, treatment with Lacan, it's full of little vignettes <laughs> like that. You know, he would take out a bottle of Jack Daniels and start drinking <laughs> it in the middle of the session and start counting his money and weird things, you know, that didn't seem to have anything to do with um, uh, so-called treatment. Uh, but it, I saw it as uh, something rather Zen-like, uh, even more existential uh, about Lacan. Uh, you know, don't forget Lacan uh, started out as a phenomenologist, not a structural linguistic. Uh, and uh, I don't think he ever quite lost his connection uh, with the existential um, tradition. And that uh, shows in his uh, erratic uh, treatment behavior. That doesn't come from being a structural linguist. But there's there's something about language as well, isn't there? Where I'm thinking more of Merleau Ponty, where where there's this idea that um, language, or when we when we speak, um, is full of this kind of primitive, um, kind of sensual, emotional, sensual sort of. Um, experience that's running through it that somehow is is communicated but we don't realize that it's communicated mm -hmm. and 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 it does something that we I, it's not i don't think it's even pre-reflective mm -hmm. and i wouldn't mm -hmm. use the word unconscious mm -hmm. there's something that there's so much going on that we we just don't realize we we uh, and maybe we shouldn't maybe we shouldn't try and say what it is oh yeah i agree i uh you know, uh, Merleau-Ponty's uh, phenomenology of perception, uh, in a sense, was his reply to Sartre's being a nothingness. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like he's having a dialogue with Sartre throughout the entire book, especially the last chapter on freedom, uh, which is a remarkable uh, chapter, maybe the best uh, piece that's ever been written on the nature of freedom. And he's having a direct argument with Sartre in that chapter, you know, uh, where he's saying that Sartre is suggesting you can just change yourself whenever you want to, um, which in some ways you could say uh, theoretically might be the case, but uh, Merleau-Ponty's point is that you're not likely to do it. Uh, you know, we, uh, part of the human condition is favoring uh, our histories and our ways of behaving. And, um, but it, it's a very, very lovely argument. Uh, and, um, and I think uh, for the most part, they're in agreement with, with the nature of, uh, of free, free will and free choice. And he does have quite a lot to say in that chapter about the ego and how the ego is in opposition uh, to, um, uh, to desire. Now, of course, the favorite concept in Merleau-Ponty as you know, is ambiguity. Um, and that I've uh, understood to be um, his version of Heidegger's uh, mystery, you know, that everything is a mystery because we can't know things. Uh, with, uh, uh, in fact, one of uh, Merleau-Ponty's definition of the unconscious was ambiguous perception. So they're all trying to find a way around uh, this notion of the unconscious. Uh, like uh, Sartre, uh, Merleau-Ponty was also very, very devoted to uh, the use of the word consciousness. Uh, and, uh, and he felt, of course, that the entire body is conscious. It's, it's not just the brain. Um, but uh, um, Heidegger, uh, Sartre did move away from using uh, that language uh, over, over the years and uh, even admitted one day in an interview late in his life that his early work had been far too devoted to Descartes and that that's why he was stuck in this uh, consciousness thing, you know, the, you know, which of course is about rationality. Anyway, it's all very useful, isn't it, in our work as practitioners, uh, not in adopting techniques, but just in understanding how 
puzzling and mysterious the relationship really is. Yes, I, 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 when you said about Myrna Ponte and ambiguity, I was thinking some, sometimes when you kind of accidentally almost say something that is, is terribly ambiguous or paradoxical to somebody, they, mm -hmm. it, it just captures a person to be, to start to think. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and they'll often kind of follow something for weeks, you know, mm -hmm. but they can't, they can't make it mesh. Mm -hmm. um, but it keeps it I don't know does it keep their desire engaged in some way but well I think it I think it does I, I think um, of course what I love about uh, 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 Freud's notion of interpretation is that you're really repeating back what you heard your patient tell you with different words and, uh, and in some ways we can, uh, we can render the same interpretation dozens of times as, as long as we use different words, because if we just keep using the same words every time, it becomes rote. Uh, that's what takes our patients by surprise. I heard you say this, and in their mind, they said something totally different and that puzzles them and it gets them to thinking about it. And I think the greatest gift that any of us can have in the psychoanalytic um, experience is developing curiosity. Uh, it's the best tool that we as practitioners have. We're just so curious to get to know this person and we never will really get to know this person. Uh, there's so many layers and layers to it. Uh, but as long as we're curious, uh, there's a vital element that we're bringing into the relationship. And by our curiosity, we're trying to help them become curious, uh, not just complain about this and that, to be curious about why they're experiencing things of the way that they do. That's where real change, I think, eventually evolves. Michael, I think it's time that I to say thank you. I mean, thank you for talked about freedom for freeing us up you know from our, <laughs> hopefully our own patterns that we might actually help us try to uh, uh to, to do something new you know to um perhaps surprise not only our clients but ourselves and i realized that you don't mean that in our next session we should all necessarily drink a bottle of jack daniels in the yes, middle of it. right but i wouldn't I recommend that, that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So maybe, only, maybe only Lacan could get away with that kind of behavior. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know if there's things I'd like to say thank you. Well, thank you very much. I really, really enjoyed uh, getting to know you, and I loved your questions and your comments, and it's always helpful. Uh, I have a lot to think about. So thank you again so much. It was really my pleasure.